Ah, perfect. Okay, that's great. All right, be right back. Ugh, that really is such a good cover photo, Catherine. You see how it matches my background photo? Yeah, too? it's a little trippy, but yeah. you know, I'm I'm working with it. What I should have done is like the photo within the photo effect. Mm -hmm. it depends on where I am on the screen. So it would have been like, you know how they have those backgrounds that you can actually have like video going. Oh. So it's actually just you kind of like going over the longest ever snow field just like film yourself mirror forever <laughs> well if i'd known that was an option that would have been... <laughs> can hear maggie chewing in the background only a, only a light bit okay <laughs> maggie is Catherine's incredibly cute golden retriever puppy who is um, now becoming more of a full-sized dog, but still <laughs> loves interrupting Zoom meetings. How old is she? She's 10 months now. Oh, that's still a puppy. <laughs> okay. So it looks like we have 122 people <laughs> RSVP'd. Um, I think maybe we'll give it one more minute. We're still at 49 participants. I'm sure not everyone will show up, but I'll give them a chance to. Okay, um, at this time, I guess I'll ask everyone to uh, turn off their video so that we can save on some bandwidth. And um, Catherine, whenever you're ready, go ahead and start presenting. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for joining tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I am a Seattle Mountaineers climb leader, um, basic grad and intermediate student. And Leanna and I are uh, co-leading the basic glacier travel course this year. Um, tonight I'll be talking about the Ptarmigan Traverse, which is a high alpine traverse between the North Cascades and the Glacier Peak Wilderness um, that I did with three other girls last summer. And feel free to... Um, Interrupt me if you have questions or just type them in the chat and I probably won't see the chat during the presentation, but um, I will get to any questions afterwards. Um, so 
the first time I ever heard about the Ptarmigan Traverse was in this article by Outside Online that calls it the country's most beautiful mountaineering route. And as soon as I saw that, I knew it was something I wanted to do. Um, it took me a few years to, to get around to it. But um, like I said, it's between the North Cascades and Glacier Peak. I'll show you on a map in a second. Um, distance really depends on kind of what peaks you do along the way and um, if you get lost. Uh, but we, I think we went about 40 miles um, and about almost 19,000 feet of elevation gain. It's slightly downhill, net downhill from north to south, though it can be done from south to north. Uh, but the common way is uh, north to south. Time of year, July and August is probably best. Um, this year is probably going to be a later snowpack, though this year might not be your best bet for doing this route. Um, I think there are, the time we went was actually pretty good. There were only a few areas where we, I think, wish we had a little bit more snow coverage. So we went at the end of July, early August. Um, you do not need permits to do the route, which is kind of nice. Um, if you can't get permits for anything in the North Cascades, uh, I think the only thing you need is a National Forest Service parking pass to park at Downey Creek. Um, biggest logistical challenges for this route are that you need a car shuttle that takes a really long time or really nice friends who are going to drop you off and pick you up. Um, and this year specifically, um, and I'll touch on this at the end, there are road closures on both ends. So before you uh, think of this as maybe a good 2022 option. So it is um, right up here in this red rectangle. So you can kind of see on this left-hand map, that's the route. Um, so it starts at the Cascade River Road. So right by Sahali Peak and ends on the Seattle River Road, um, which is you access right outside of Darrington. So it's really, really tucked in there. It's that beautiful area you see when you're on the top of Sahale or Glacier Peak. So uh, car shuttle, the way we accessed it was drove two cars from Seattle to Downey Creek, left a car at Downey Creek, and then drove the other car to Cascade Pass and then did the opposite. So it's five or six hours um, of transport either way. Um, and a lot of that is because it's, these two roads are um, gravel, so they take a while. So I went with four ladies, uh, Leanne Wolf, who's in the Mountaineers, her friend, Melanie, and then Melanie's friend, Ruth, who's from Colorado. So kind of a cobbled together group. Um, Leanne and I had the most climbing experience, but everyone had been on a glacier and done some rock climbing before. But I think it's more important to have probably one person who has pretty good glacier travel skills. And then really it's mostly just backpacking on a glacier. Um, gear we went tried to go as light as we could um two stoves uh, the wind burner worked really great the jet foil was mediocre didn't need too much fuel because it was summer and it wasn't that cold we just each brought one canister um two water filters we mostly relied on a gravity which was not great um, i'd recommend more of the squeeze be free type filter or a pump filter um, we ended up with one, we did one 60 meter rope for four people, which worked fine other than any rock roots. Um, it made everyone going up a little, take a little longer um, and made the rappels take a while. Uh, we had planned to do a lot more peaks than we ended up being able to do. Um, we took a pretty full rack of cams and nuts. Um, though I think if you planned out your peaks along the way, you could probably maybe just bring nuts. Uh, 
a couple of pickets. We did two two person tents and had an in reach. And then otherwise, the individual gear was pretty standard for glacier travel. Um, I did like having a little stomach pack uh, for peaks along the way, and then both uh, approach shoes to wear at camp. And um, I used some pretty lightweight mountaineering boots. Uh, the one thing I'll mention later on, um, or touch on later on, is the crampons. I ended up um, bringing really lightweight aluminum crampons um, that had were not great on my boots. Um, and there was enough change between rock and snow that I would actually recommend steel despite the weight. So here we are at um, the Cascade Pass trailhead um, where you would access the Hale Pass, uh, sorting our gear. We slept in the car there the night before. And so we had a full first day to start. So we did this in five days. I think you could easily stretch it out or you could probably condense it into four days if you didn't um, do any peaks along the way. We had planned to do mix up, formidable spider, sentinel, dome and sinister. And in the end we did mix up and dome. So I'll get to that. Uh, day one, we went from the Cascade Pass trailhead to Kool-Aid Lake. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the switchbacks that lead up from the Cascade Pass trailhead. Um, they look worse than they are. They just take a long time. And then Cascade Pass is right here, if you can see my mouse. So if you were going to Sahala, you'd go up. Or if you were going to Stahican, you'd go to the right here. But there's a pretty faint climber's trail that goes south and takes you to Cache Glacier right here. Mix up peak, you can see really prominently from um, the parking lot. And then you just kind of hop over a little ridge and traverse over the lakes. So here's that view from um, the Cascade Pass Trail. You can see Johannesburg there on the right. And then mix up is this one um, on the left there. I'd say we probably all started out with about 55 pounds of gear, which was a little heavier than ideal, but five days of food weighs a lot. So it's a pretty easy trip up to Cascade Pass. Um, beautiful weather. And you can see this red line is roughly the route we took um to get over to mix up so in this photo you can see cascade pass is right where my cursor is you can see the faintly see the trail approaching it and then you can see the trail going up to sahali arm and sahali peak there so we're just on the opposite side of that and it was a pretty rough trail starting out um, but easy to nav. I mean, the wayfinding was very obvious. Um, so just kind of unmaintained trail, crossing a lot of snow fields um, where a fall would have been problematic. And you come up over and you see the uh, Cache Glacier, which is this guy. Um, so we ended up, because we were going to mix up uh, followed this red line to Gunsight Notch, and you go around Gunsight Notch and up Mix Up. Um, if you wanted to skip Mix Up, which I would recommend, um, you would just hop right over to right over Cash Coal, and this is fairly easy uh, easy travel. We did not rope up for any of this, I don't think. Uh, so to go to Mix Up. Gunsight Notch has a really pronounced U and V. Um, ultimately, you wanna go around this big block here. Um, so if the V is available or is accessible, then that's the better way to go. It, there was this, there was no snow bridge, so we couldn't do that. So we went through the U. 
um, which you can see here is a little little spicy, but um, fine. And we were able to stash our packs just in the snow. Um, so as soon as you get around, get over the notch and through, I believe this is formidable um, in the background. It's really beautiful out there. Um, and then mix up peak. It's a combination of fairly low grade rock climbing and scrambling. Um, I wouldn't do it unless you've like done everything else in the area and want to say you did it. Um, the quality of climbing, climbing is pretty mediocre, um, but there are some really great views from the top and all around. Um, so we had two fairly easy pitches at the start, a little crumbly, scrambled up some heather and then scrambled up. Actually, the coolest part of climbing was this, uh, basically a staircase. It was maybe third class scrambling, um, but pretty fun. And then we um, did one pitch up to the summit block here. And then we rappelled down probably, I think it was two or three wraps and then scrambled back down and then another two wraps down to get to the base. Um, and I would say the anchors were not ones that you'd want to, you don't want to fall. But again, really fantastic views. You can see Sahali in the background there. Um, it and this ended up taking a really, really long time to do um, with the one rope and some less experienced climbers. Um, if you want to do mix up, I would actually just recommend doing it as a day trip from the Cascade Pass trailhead um, and not tacking it onto a ptarmigan trip. So this is showing our descent. Um, and I think right below this photo on the left is that V notch. So by the time we got done with mix up, it was pretty late in the day. I can't remember how long it, exactly it took, but a very long time. Um, and so we traversed over the Cache Glacier. There was a little bit of a move to get between the snow and rock to get over and the cash coal, um, but otherwise really, really beautiful. Um, and one benefit to ending so late in the day was that we got an incredible sunset. This is probably one of the most beautiful moments of the whole trip. And then did a little short traverse to Kool-Aid Lake, which is our first stop for the day, or first uh, campsite. So you can see on this second map, Kool-Aid Lake is this tiny little thing. It's uh, barely a lake. Uh, and day two was, the, the theme of this is that there's a lot of traversing. Um, so big long traverse uh, over to past Formidable um, and then down to Yang Yang Lakes. We had planned to do Formidable when we started out this day. Uh, this probably was a 12 hour day and you can see that it was four and a half miles. So that's another theme of this trip is it doesn't look like a lot of distance or elevation gain, but it, the travel is really, really slow. So here's us, um, caption is wrong. Uh, here's us departing Kool-Aid Lake. It was really just kind of a, enough water for us to filter. Um, we did have mountain goats, uh, a few of the camp, pretty persistent mountain goats, uh, just at the campsites. Um, so they clearly know where to go. And so our route for the day is kind of along this ridge and over. This is formidable in the background. Um, our crux of the day was almost right out of the gate. There's this little feature called the red ledges and getting onto them, there was this little snow bridge um, that was, took us about two or three hours to figure out how to get around. Um, 
So I think if we had been there a week earlier or a week later, it would have been a lot easier. But you can never predict those things. So this is it up close. It was pretty thin. So we didn't feel great about going over it. And we ex kind of went under it and explored what that would look like. So this is me um, under that snow bridge trying to scout out the route. Uh, there ended up being another team who came up um, and they put a picket at the bottom and the top and ended up going over and had no problems. And our team went under, which was, I think, more fun. And this, I would say, is the busiest the route ever got. Um, there were probably two or three to four parties at every campsite every night. Um, but this is our traffic jam while we were waiting for a goat to get out of the way. But the actual red ledges themselves were very benign. Uh, so as soon as we rounded that corner where the, that mountain goat was, um, this is our view. And so we had a big long traverse um, across this valley and up this glacier. And again, Formidable is on the right here. So this is the middle Cascade Glacier. Um, this section in particular was a lot of changing between rock and snowfield and glacier, and probably the point at which I would have most wanted to have steel crampons, so I didn't have to keep changing. But this type of terrain that you see on the left was very standard for the trip. Um, if you like walking on glaciers in mostly flat terrain, this is the trip for you. So this map shows a little bit of a blow up of what we just did. That's that um, getting onto the glacier. And then there's this little notch between Mount Formidable and Spider. Um, we were already pretty late in the day by then. So we decided not to go for Spider but still wanted to do formidable. Um, and I would say a lot, almost every day there was like a big glacier that would end in a notch and then have a really steep downhill after that. So I think going north to south was kind of nice because you'd um, get this big view of a, of a glacier and cross it and then go down a pretty steep downhill. But you can see in the photo on the left, that's the Leconte Glacier. And so the next day we would traverse up this, um, this high arm of the glacier and onto it. So we got to here on the map, planning to do Formidable. And this, you get up to that little notch and this is what you see. You have to go a pretty steep downhill, and then I believe the route goes on to these rocks on the left side of this image and around. I don't know which one is the true summit, um, but it was already 3 p.m., and it looked like a little more than uh, we were willing to do. Um, so ultimately, we just tagged what we called Mount Informidable, which is this little, not even this peak, just this little guy here. Uh, and that was really lovely. Um, we ended up running into a group of mountaineers at the campsite later that night who had done Formidable and said it was eight or nine hours round trip from, um, from this point right here. And they had just left the campsite super early. Uh, and I think they got into the next campsite at 10 or 11 p.m. So. If you want to do formidable, um, I would say plan on an extra day. There's a little campsite right here. Um, or you can do it as an independent trip where you would camp at Kool-Aid Lake, do formidable as a day trip from Kool-Aid Lake, and then go back the third day. So 
Uh, it would have been nice to do, but we just didn't have the, the time. Uh, they also said that it was pretty chossy, which we were not in the mood for. So instead we decided to go to camp um, and had a beautiful traverse over. These are the two lakes. Um, and it was one of the most beautiful campsites. It was fantastic. Uh, I'm really glad that we got there a little early because it was so gorgeous. And we could wash off in the creek here and dry our clothes. Um, this is definitely, I think this is the best campsite. So I would definitely recommend planning some time to actually enjoy it. All right, day three from Yang Yang Lakes to White Rock. So we start up here at Yang Yang. Um, and we had planned to do Sentinel Peak this day. So we started out early. Here is Yang Yang Lakes in the morning, a really beautiful ascent out of it. This is one of my favorite parts of the trip, um, just this beautiful alpine zone um, with these little tiny lakes. And then on to the Lacante Glacier. And you can see, this is that one that we were, let me go back. It's this big glacier here that you could see in the distance. And it has this long arm that stretches out. And so this is us on that. So we roped up basically as soon as we got to that. Um, but prior, the ascent out of Yang Yang was just um, like a little climber's trail. And this is super mellow, beautiful terrain. And we crossed over, you can see right here, there's a little notch. We crossed over to get um, onto the west side of this ridge. And this is Sentinel Peak on the left here. So we had planned to do that. This was the worst mountain I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, it was completely crumbly. You would take one step up and it would just crumble around you. Um, it was the only time that I was like truly afraid that I would die on the trip. Um, the only time I cried on the trip was here. Uh, we had, I think the route ideally goes kind of up here maybe. Um, there was this big, uh, I guess it was kind of a Bergstrand crack hole in the snow. So we tried to get around it. We ended up, you can kind of see us there ascending this snow, this super steep snow. Um, so I, we ended up getting onto these rocks here and trying to go up this way. Um, even Leanne, who apparently loves Choss, said it was the worst she's ever been on. So, uh, and apparently spider is worse. So the, I don't think the climbing in this area is actually very good. So maybe just enjoy the glacier. Um, yeah, we eventually made it down, we didn't die. And we got onto the South Cascade Glacier, which is enormous and beautiful. Um, all this website talks a little bit about um, the South C Cascade Glacier. It is, um, one of, I think, the longest uh, continually monitored glacier in the US. So there are four big glaciers that they've been monitoring since, I think, the late 50s or early 60s. Uh, and it's to just measure uh, the recession of the glacier. So there are these big probes in it. Um, and there's a research center, little research station at the base of it. So we crossed over. And then this was the view, kind of the same concept as I talked about before, where there's a big long glacier, you go over a notch and then there's a really steep downhill. 
Um, so the notch was somewhere here. And this is a view down to White Rock Lakes, which was our next campsite. Um, this is a stunning campsite. It would have been the best, but it was kind of cold. Um, but we could see Dome Sinister and Gunsight from it. Um, we had a persistent mountain goat there as well. Um, but yeah, this was incredible. You can see our, our tent over there. Um, this one was a little harder to find good campsites at, um, but I think we ended up with about four parties there. So day four, we went from White Rock Lakes, um, pretty steep ascent out of it. And then if you wanted to skip dome, you can see this faint dotted line here. That's the standard uh, way out. Uh, we crossed over um, the Dana Glacier, which is right here, and then over to the Dome Glacier to do Dome Peak. Um, you can also go kind of the standard route and then get, let me see if I can annotate. You could do that as well. Um, and there's a campsite here called Itswood Ridge. So that's a commonly done uh, variation. This just cuts off a little time. So this is just uh, departing White Rock Lakes. And again, we went basically, oops. So I believe the common way out is like that. And we traversed under and over. And this is Dome Peak. And this was pretty obvious, easy glacier travel here. So this is that ridge we went up. There's some more of this like mixed snow rock terrain where steel crampons would have been great. Um, we saw a marmot or two, not very heavily, not a lot of wildlife on this trip. And the marmots were definitely a lot scrappier than the Mount Rainier ones. So this is on the Dana Glacier. And then crossing over to the dome, I think we did like right up here. And as soon as we crossed over, we got a great view of Glacier Peak. So this is as soon as we were on the Dome Glacier. Um, if you're just doing Dome as a, a one-off trip, it's a pretty straightforward climb. Um, you can see some faint tracks. There was one party ahead of us on this. Um, but basically for dome, you just go up and around. We camped here, which is dome coal. Um, and then it was probably a hundred feet to the summit, maybe hundred feet. Uh, so you can see on the right here, we had a nice bivy spot um, that earlier in the day looked like it would be really lovely. And then later in the day was not so lovely. There's space for one tent here, and then there's big flat rock on the other side with space for one more tent. So if you have a big party, you should camp lower. Uh, so we set up camp and then did a really quick uh, afternoon jaunt up Dome Peak, um, which was, we did not rope up. Um, on the upper glacier part there. 
it was probably again one or 200 feet of snow um and then this rock ridge and we the very last little bit um we put in some pro if you were confident or didn't have any pro and still wanted to do it you could certainly do it um it's a little exposed on both sides but i'd say it's similar there's kind of a it's a little similar to the whales back on Sue's. um it was nice to have some stuff in there, but uh, you could certainly make do with a few nuts if that's all you had. Uh, we saw a ptarmigan, which was the coolest part on the ptarmigan traverse, and that has been verified by Misha's husband. Um, and here is Leanne uh, coming back. So I think as soon as she did it, um, I think she was glad to have pro and she led this pitch, but um, it's really not quite as exposed as it seems initially. So take a good rock climber with you to set it up. Um, we came back to camp uh, and all of a sudden it got totally socked in. Um, and we had planned to do Sinister Peak the next day which you can see here was not visible in the afternoon um, and has a pretty spicy glacier to get to it. The rock, I think, is fairly straightforward. It's a scramble, um, but we were a little concerned about the glacier travel. Um, but regardless, we had a nice little campsite. You can. This is that rock we set up on. Um, and so we spent the night there uh, in a cloud, woke up, everything was soaking wet because of condensation, um, total whiteout, couldn't see a thing. And so decided to uh, skip Sinister because we wanted really good visibility for that glacier crossing and then just head out the whole way on the fifth day. Um, so we went from Dome Peak down the Dome Glacier, it's what Ridge, which is kind of the standard campsite for doing Dome Peak, um, is right about here. There's also a campsite at Cub Lake. And then otherwise it's, uh, there's a pretty horrendous bushwhack right kind of in this zone. And as soon as you get onto the Downey Creek Trail here, it's totally cruiser. So we went, we had originally planned to split this up into two days, um, go over to Sinister and then camp at its foot Ridge or Cub Lake. Um, but because we skipped Sinister, we decided to just go out um, and all of our stuff was wet from being in a cloud. So this is our descent, uh, not awesome. Um, but you can see this would be the ascent if you are going to Dome Peak from the south. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and as tends to happen on the final day of the trip, we took like four total photos. So this is the, this is Cub Lake from its foot Ridge. It's a really beautiful area. Um, ton of, tons of mosquitoes here. Um, unfortunately, no one really took a photo through the bushwhack, but this is like a very benign version of what it was like. It's all slide alder. Um, and it was so bad that you weren't ever standing on anything. You were just like standing on little branches of alder. Um, it probably took us, I think it's about half a mile or a mile of that. And it took us over two hours to get through. Um, there is apparently a way that isn't as bad that we didn't find. So that involves some sort of log crossing that we missed. Um, so if you plan to do this, I would research as much as you can about this area because that was absolutely horrendous. Definitely the worst bushwhacking I've ever been in. Um, the way out is there are a lot of avalanche paths. So it's a lot of just kind of new growth, um, but the section does take quite a long time. But again, the Downey Creek Trail is lovely after you get there. 
Um, and so yeah, so we ended up at the Downey Creek Trailhead, had another five or six hour car shuttle where we picked up the car, drove back to Cascade Pass to get the other car and back to Seattle. So it was a little bit of a late night. Um, but I think we were all glad to be out that night. So total was five days ultimately. Um, and here is uh, a little info on the roads this year. So again, Cascade River Road is this one up here. That's the one you would take um, right outside of Marble Mount to get to Sahale and Boston Basin area. So there was a really big slide there this year. Um, and I believe Tess, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's the kind of common area that it does slide right after the El Dorado Trailhead. But this year was substantially worse. Um, and it sounds like they might try to do a more permanent fix on that area. So I guess for any climbing in that area, just make sure you check in advance. And then it sounds like the Downey Creek Road is also closed for the Seattle River Road. Um, so again, probably not a good trip to do this year. If you do plan to do it, just check in advance. Um, and thank you, Tess, for gathering this information. And that is it. Um, I will. Awesome. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, did I think there were a few questions in the chat? Take one look. Um, Okay, uh, so Tad asked, why didn't the gravity filter work well? Um, it took a really long time, <laughs> was the biggest issue. Um, I really like the, I think it's the Katahdin or Katahdin B Free, which is just a little squeeze filter. Um, that has worked, it's pretty fast. Um, but yeah, the gravity just took too long. And we, when we got to the Downey Creek, um trail at the very end if you can see it right like kind of out here we were all out of water and had to wait for over half an hour for the gravity filter to filter everything so not a good option i would say if fine option as one filter but definitely have another one that, that the whole group is able to use so um, Evan asked, can you mention what sections would be better with more snow, uh, mm -hmm. like le red ledges or sections less snow with less snow? Um, generally speaking, I find traveling on snow a lot easier than rock, but I know that's uh, personal preference. So I probably would have been fine about two weeks earlier, just for a little bit less rock. Um, but yeah, I think the red ledges is probably the biggest area where having a little bit more snow would have been nice. So we could just pop right up onto them. Um, that and on mix up, um, this, this section here, uh, more snow would have been nice. Or I'd say if you're doing mix up, go a little earlier season or like late August. So there's no snow. Cool. Um, Juliana Watson wanted to say really great photos. What kind of camera were you using? I think these were all iPhone photos. iPhone? Oh, nice. <laughs> Most of these were not mine. Uh, they were this Bruce, who's the one from Colorado. So whatever. Okay. Cool. Um, Sky and Garrett said, uh, did you wish you had any extra days in your itinerary or did five, day, five days feel like enough? Five felt good for me. Um, I mean, it, had we been able to do Sinister, I think six would have been great. Um, I would probably still plan on six and try to get Sinister just because it's far enough out there that you don't really want to go do it as one-off. 
Um, yeah, I'd say plan on plan on six. If you end up a day earlier, then that's how it goes. And if you want to do formidable and sinister, plan on seven days. But I think everywhere we stopped, like prior to the dome camp, was good. There aren't really other options for camping beyond that. So. Okay. Awesome. Um, and Liana just asked, were there any creek crossings you may not have been able to do in a high snow year? No, I don't think so. Um, I think the most treacherous was like crossing the lake at White Rocks Lake, but no, no creek crossings. Um, actually, if you do, you do have to cross on the way out, right where that bushwhack is. Um, and I think if you cross it earlier, you can avoid the bushwhack, but we did cross that. And I think it was a pretty big log that looked relatively permanent. But. By then you'd be really motivated to get out though. So. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I guess if anybody has any other questions, like feel free to um, raise your hand or chime in. I think one just got popped in from Evan that was asking about more snow um, versus, and like climbing versus the traverse with more snow, Catherine, right? Those are kind of two different things, like certain peaks with more snow versus just the traverse with more snow. Um. I think Sentinel, if you had a ton of snow, you could definitely do. Um, maybe even Formidable would be easier with more snow. Ultimately, I kind of am glad. I think the time we went ended up being pretty great. Like we had amazing weather every single day, except for the last day. And other than that red ledges section, it wasn't um, impassable ever. Um, so I would say, this year, you, again, you could get away with it being later than early August, but I think mid-July would kind of be a sweet spot. Let's see. And then how many miles? Um, oh, and then Dome was totally passable that time of year. I don't, I think it, you could do Dome even later in the season. Um, sinister, I didn't get a very good look at the glacier, um, but it, it is a pretty gnarly glacier, so that might be one that would be problematic later on with some snow bridges. Um, see, Tess, do you know about the Downey Creek road closure? Yeah, so it's not the road, it's like the actual trail is closed because oh. of wildfires yeah. and danger mm -hmm. trees. So they're worried about like hazard trees just falling on people um, because there hasn't been enough time for sort of all the trees to okay. do their thing. Like that they sounds still, like yeah. more permanent. Yeah. For this year. So you can go out the alternate way to Stahican. <laughs> Which might be nice. Let's see, and then the gear lists. Um, going south to north, um, I think, you know, ultimate, the elevation gain is kind of a wash. I think it's a thousand feet more going south to north. So that's not a huge deal. Um, it was kind of nice to like always be looking into the sun and having a nice view of the sun. Maybe that's a a reason to go north to south um and yeah just the the terrain where it'd be like a flat glacier you'd get to a notch and then go straight down i think you'd have you have a much better vista of where you're going when you go north to south whereas if you went south to north you'd kind of hit a wall have to go straight up it and not really know it was on the other side um and you might just quit as soon as you got to the bushwhack. So, 
Uh, let's see, Lacante. Um, I, I don't know if we considered that one, um, but as soon as we saw how bad Sentinel was, we basically just gave up on everything else. Um, I would have been totally happy doing the whole trip um, with just, I think Dome is definitely worth it because it doesn't add a lot of distance. It's still a lot of just traversing on glaciers and it's not a very hard peak. Um, but I don't think any, unless you really like scrambling up Tross, I don't think any of the other peaks are worth it. Um, so, Tad, I think we could have gotten away without the cams, especially if we hadn't done mix up. I think they were nice to have on mix up. Um, but if you were comfortable with just nuts, that would have been totally fine. Um, let's see, Stahican exit. Tess, you might actually know this better than I do. Um, I mm. think you go, would it be this valley? That seems likely. Yeah, it's actually kind of a, um, yeah, I think, I think that is right. I don't have my map pulled up, um, but, um, you know, folks do come in from the other side occasionally um, and explore um the ptarmigan area um but obviously like this trip already requires a lot of logistics and when you go through stahican <laughs> um <laughs> that's like a whole other set of logistics as far as like ferries plus buses plus backpacks um so if you had lots of time um then that would be awesome you can even start farther north and do el dorado and Sahale and get to um, go right over Sahale and up to Cash Bowl. That would be very cool. Um, and if you did bring a lot of gear with you, you could also get Gunsight Peak, which I think is five, nine minimum, more like five, 10, but looks beautiful and is apparently excellent rock. Um, I pack. Uh, so it was a backpacking pack that was 60 liters, which was funny. Um, it was a little heavy at the start, but the good thing about backpacking is that it keeps getting lighter as you eat your food. Um, I did not necessarily bring enough food um, because we had longer days than I expected. Um, we did bring all of our food in uh, just the, like Dyneema bear bags. Uh, so I don't know that that would be a necessity. Um, and then I brought the little REI flash summit pack. So the one that like folds up into nothing. Obviously, if you weren't doing mix, mix up or any of the peaks along there or formidable, you would not need that. Because for dome, we basically just brought, I don't think we brought a pack because it was 200 feet away. Um, did you ever consider doing cash coal instead of gun sight notch? So we did both. Um, so the only reason to do gun sight notch is to get to mix up peak. So we went up gun sight notch, up mix up, and then back down and up to cash coal. And I assume someone has done it in winter. And it's, you can do it as a ski traverse too. So obviously that would be earlier season. But yeah, people do it in a day on skis. Wonderful. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Okay. 
looks looks like we don't. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. I guess in that case, um, Catherine, did was there any like final thoughts you wanted to to uh, mention? Um, this is probably the coolest climb I, or trip I've ever been on. So I would highly recommend it. Um, it's important to have good people with you because you're with them a lot. Um, yeah, you'll see terrain that like no one else sees. It's not very crowded. Um, at least it wasn't until this presentation. Uh, and yeah, I can't recommend it enough. I would skip the skip the peaks and just go for the glacier travel. And then I added a few resources here at the end. Um, this is my Caltopo map that shows our um, our track for the whole trip. Um, there's that outside online article if you want to get inspired, and then uh, some trip reports. And if you just Google search it, you'll find a ton of trip reports. And so when you do go on it, I would just read as much as you can um, to try to get every little every little bit of data. Um, there's the Caltopo. Um, I did not note like specific features and it's just the just the track but it's it's pretty obvious uh it's a very obvious trail there are enough people um doing it that there's a good boot pack most of the way okay awesome thank you so much catherine um we'll have the uh recording up soon um and then uh, also we'll send out the slides all right. So thank you everyone for attending. Thanks so much, everyone. Mm -hmm. Hope yeah, you get out there. Nice. Thanks. Thanks again, Catherine. Bye. Bye.